and welcome to Australia in Space TV. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media, publishers of the Australia in Space magazine. Today we're joined by Professor Stephen Tingay. He's the executive director with the Curtin Institute of Radio Astronomy, or Kira, at Curtin University in Perth. We're going to be looking at DART, the double asteroid redirection test conducted by NASA. Uh, and Stephen has written an article today uh, in relation to the change in the orbit uh, of this particular asteroid uh, of about 30 minutes. So without further ado, Professor Stephen Tingay. Stephen Tingay, thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV. Yeah, pleasure, Chris. Wonderful. You're the Executive Director, Curtin Institute of Radio Astronomy uh, there in Perth at Curtin University. Uh, we're going to be talking about DART, the double asteroid redirection test that NASA conducted. Uh, you've written an article. We'll have a link in the show notes uh, on the conversation. But yeah, talk us through the test because it's been quite a success and way more than what they uh, envisaged, 30-minute change in the orbit. Yeah, DART has been a pretty amazing mission uh, led, led by NASA, but also with the pretty significant involvement of the Italian Space Agency. Right. Uh, the mission launched last November and it's taken nine months to reach its target, uh, which is a, an asteroid called Dimorphos. Uh, and the point of the mission was to attempt to change the trajectory of that asteroid. And it's the first test of uh, planetary defence techniques. So as people may have seen in the movies, you know, for example, Bruce Willis, etc., cetera, um, changing the path of an asteroid so that it doesn't collide with the Earth. Uh, so it's the first test of that particular uh, technique and it, it turned out to be incredibly successful. It's like hitting a bullet with a bullet. Um, did, the, did the change occur as they'd anticipated it, it from the way you've written, it's changed because of the recoil uh, from the explosion, or was it supposed to push uh, the change? Did it occur as per the plan? Uh, hitting a bullet with a bullet is not, not a bad description. Um, after the nine-month journey to get to the asteroid, uh, DART was travelling at about 25,000 kilometres per hour, um, and it autonomously steered itself to the yeah. target. Uh, Dimorphos is an asteroid of around about 160 metres in diameter. Um, and that impact took place 11 million kilometres away from Earth. <laughs> so hitting a bullet with a bullet is not a, not a bad analogy, um, sort of in space terms. Uh, scored a bullseye. Um, it hit the centre of the asteroid to within sort of 10%. Um, and what's interesting about Dimorphos is that it's part of a binary asteroid system. It orbits a larger asteroid uh, called Didymos. It's about 780 metres in diameter. Uh, and that target was chosen because astronomers from the Earth could measure the orbit really accurately of Dimorphos around Didymos. And it had a, an 11 hour, 55 minute orbit. And so that was very regular like clockwork. Um, so as a target, it was a really controlled environment to do this experiment. So crash a spacecraft into Dimorphos and see if the orbital period of that asteroid around the other one changed. Um, so that's a really clever experiment. And uh, yeah, it was very uncertain what the, what the end result was going to be. Um, so it depends a lot on uncertain factors, exactly where the, the spacecraft hits, hits, hits the asteroid, uh, what the composition of the asteroid is and how it reacts to the impact. Um, they sort of calculated that the minimum threshold for declaring success for the mission was to change the orbit by about 73 seconds, so a bit over a minute. Uh, as it turned out, they changed the orbital period by in excess of 30 minutes. 32 minutes plus or minus two minutes. Uh, so it was due to the, the impact of the collision itself, obviously. Uh, but there was a, an amazing um, plume cloud of debris uh, generated by the, by the impact. Um, and the, the, the spray of that material in one direction caused a, a recoil effect in the other direction. And that, that really added to the um, effect of the impact. 
Did they was it did the change occur in the direction that they had anticipated or maybe weren't quite sure how it was going to actually occur? Because they, they, obviously they were, um, when they were talking about 73 seconds and they did it by 30 minutes, they obviously weren't sure, uh, you know, even a small fraction, 73 seconds versus the, that type of change is a massive variation, right? It is. Uh, it, it's possible that uh, they were quite conservative with their minimum thickness, um, and it, it's probably the case that, that, that they may have expected or hoped for something more than that, but that was declared as the, the minimum threshold. Um, I think broadly speaking that the change was was largely in the direction expected because uh, they very carefully calculated um, the point in the orbit of the asteroid around the other one where the impact would occur and, and they understood very carefully the direction of that impact. So, so broadly speaking, um, it would have been as expected what, what was really uncertain was, um, I think, generally the, the characteristics of the asteroid itself. Um, is it a, a, a solid object? Is it a loose aggregation of material? Um, and how would a, you know, an impact at 25,000 kilometres per second, um, what would that result in? Um, the, as, it, uh, that's very good. as it turned out, I think it was... Um, yeah, probably beyond their expectations that, that uh, this sort of change in the orbit would occur. Well, it cost about $324 million. Is there more tests or is this kind of given them enough confidence that if they require it into the future that they can do it? Uh, yeah, what's the testing program that if you're aware of that? So I expect that there'll be a fairly prolonged period of the analysis of the data out of this experiment. Uh, there was an enormous amount of data collected from ground-based telescopes. There were also uh, radar systems that are still being used to monitor the aftermath. Um, and there's the data from the Italian Space Agency spacecraft that flew, flew along and uh, tailed behind DART and, and actually watched the interaction from space in real time. Uh, so I think all of those data are going to require a fair amount of analysis. There's also a, a bit of a follow-on mission from Europe called HERA that will actually visit uh, the binary system, binary asteroid system in a few years time and do a, a detailed uh, reconnaissance of the, the impact site, the crater. Um, but I, I think that this has been such a resounding success that it's highly likely that we'll see um, some further tests of this nature in the future, building up to having you know, hopefully that full capability to undertake real planetary defence missions. Yeah, it, it's pretty incredible that there's even a video of it, the Atlas observations uh, as well. Um, and if, if they're going to try it again, uh, I just hope that they don't hit one and <laughs> change it to the, such a degree that it's now got, going to actually hit us. Uh, that was why when I first read it, it was like, wow, 30 minutes is such a change, uh, so we better know what we are actually doing, uh, and no doubt they are. Um, maybe just a little bit about uh, Kira there in Perth uh, and the, kind of the, some of the work that you do. Um, does Kira, you know, are you going to be getting any research uh, out of this potentially? Uh, in, in terms of the work that, that we do in my group here in Perth, uh, this is not not a, a central uh, sort of theme to our research, but as in all things space, it's something that, that we follow very, very closely and have a general interest in. Um, and, and so being able to talk to people about it, publicise the results, um, uh, and in general terms, drawing it back to uh, the science and the engineering required to mount these missions. So my institute is a very engineering and astrophysics heavy uh, institute. Um, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of the techniques and the data processing and, and algorithms that are behind the scenes of missions like that are actually pretty common across many, many areas of astrophysics um, and in our case, radio astronomy, radio astronomy engineering. So yeah, it's a broad interest to us. Um, and look, we're, 
we're as excited as everyone else in the general public when you see spacecraft colliding with asteroids. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, no doubt. Uh, well, look, we'll uh, no doubt have someone from Curtin University join us again into the future. We have had Professor Phil Bland on uh, previously as well, so hopefully uh, we can keep that relationship going. But Professor Stephen Tingay, Executive Director, Curtin Institute of Radio Astronomy or Kira at Curtin University in Perth, thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV. No, no worries, Chris. It's a pleasure to chat. Thank you.